Oh, right, there we started. Yes, thank you very much for being here. Um, short introduction about myself. Um, I'm a Java developer for 20-something years. I work at this company called Team Rockstars IT, where we are like a special agent, which basically means you do your normal consultancy work, and if you have any free time left, you can spend it on going to conferences and talk. Um, so that's what I like to do, and uh, if there's even more free time left, I'm writing together with a colleague a book on migrating cloud native Jakarta EE, so from Java EE to Jakarta EE. Um, but today is a totally different story. It is about data oriented programming, and it's, it's not a new paradigm, it's not a paradigm specifically to the Java language. Um, but it's something that is actually coming to Java, so it might be really interesting to know something about it. Um, the first part is going to be just evolution of how we normally develop our applications or how, how we used to develop them and how they, uh, how they evolved. The second part would be a generic introduction to data-oriented programming. So again, not specific Java, but just the principles. Um, part three. We're going to look at how does Java support these new, um, the, the, this paradigm? How does it support it? Um, because there have been a lot of new features added to Java language in recent years. Um, so we're going to have a look at those, because in the final part, we're going to look at some examples of code, how we can actually you know, write this um, data-oriented code. Right, starting the evolution of an application. So this is meet Victor. Victor, he's an application developer, and he works as an in-house developer at a company. Um, and Victor is a happy developer because Victor works on timesheets. Now we all know timesheets, right? We all have to do timesheets. Um, if you're really lucky, you probably only have to enter them once a month. Or if you're really unlucky, then you have to do it on a weekly or even daily basis. So, timesheets. And Victor develops this application internally. Um, then one, it, it's a simple application. You've got a timesheet header, there's a user attached to it. There's timesheet details with uh, projects and activities. So, nothing very fancy. And soon Victor will find out. Because then the project manager comes one day and says, listen, Victor, um, something must be wrong in the system because I had someone who wasn't even attached to one of my projects actually register hours uh, to my project. And Victor thinks, hmm, that's weird. And he looks at the code and he finds, yep, that can actually be any user can book on any project. So Victor comes up with a smart solution and he enters something in between so he can actually combine and authorize which users are allowed for which projects. Life goes on and Victor seems to be happy and the company seems to be happy, but then the project manager one day drops in again and says, what is this? I have this project doing some, some API redesign and I got some front-end guy who's actually uh, writing activities, creating a new UI design, that can't be. And Victor looks at the code again, and the same story. Um, so our system evolves, doesn't it? And not only the system evolves, but the company evolves. So more and more people are coming. And when we get bigger companies, then we get more managers. No one wants it, but it happens. Um, so suddenly from a regular user, we also get um, um, uh, the, the project manager as a role, we get to see the approver. So the system grows and grows. And then things really peak and we're gonna go multi-organization. So multi multiple companies can use the software. And, 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 and this is basically what happens, right? This is how our systems evolve over time. And we add new classes and we add new functionality and then if we look at the code at some point, it will probably look something like this. Now, this could be an enterprise Java bean or whatever. Doesn't really matter. But what we see, we use encapsulation. We got object state 
and we got methods that perform operations on that state. And he, here's a good example. If a user fails to log on correctly, then probably the method, um, let's see, uh, register failed login will be called at the bottom. And basically what it does, it checks, okay, have we surpassed a threshold? And if so, we're gonna change the state of the object and we're gonna set the user to deactive. So we have these situations where we have code and data mixed together. And it always used to make sense because that is how we created our large applications. Yet, these are the classical, what we now call monolithic applications. Um, but I'm quite sure you've all noticed that there's a tendency in software engineering these days that we go more towards surfaces instead of large, larger applications. Um, so this typical application um, could be easily broken down into several independent surfaces that have some kind of intercommunication. Um, typically, we would use something like domain-driven design. Currently, there's the workshop from Ottavio going on, uh, where we could say, oh, wait, we got a user domain. So, and that contains these classes. And we could have a timesheet domain and the core data domain, and then there could be something like authorization on the side as well. So we basically, and that's the tendency we see right now in software engineering, we're decomposing the monolithic application into smaller surfaces. And then we get into the realm of where data-oriented programming would actually be applicable, because suddenly you don't have the need anymore for these large object structures where you like compose all kinds of objects, but suddenly you can do things in a different way. So let's have a look at the four principles of data-oriented programming. Again, these are the generic principles. Java will have their own set because we're not going to use them all in Java. Um, Data-oriented programming, it became very popular, and this was the article that really kicked it all off. There was, uh, it's about a year ago, and then Brian Getz, and he's like the chief language architect for the Java language at Oracle, he wrote this article, Data-oriented programming in Java. It's on InfoQ, you can find it there. It's a really great article, and he explains how we can do things in a different way. And, and since then, Java has given it a lot of attention. Um, um, the, 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 the Java podcast, the newscast, actually had a series about it. And last year at Java One, Gavin Bierman, he's also one of the advisors to the Java team, um, he had a presentation about data-oriented programming. So what are these principles? We're going to look at them first, and then we'll dive into some details. The first one is very simple. You should separate data and logic. The second one is you should store data in generic data structures. The data should be immutable, and the data schema should be separated from data representation. OK, let's dive into each of these. Um, to see what is actually meant. And still, we're getting to the code part a bit later, so just bear with me. So, separating state from logic. So, what's the idea is basically you have your code here and your data there. So, your data is in a separate class. Um, so, there's no longer this idea of encapsulation. But they're two separate entities, they're two separate groups of classes. Behavior and data. Well, one of the advantages could be that code could be reused in a different context. Before we saw some code um, where we said, okay, if, if a regular user, if he fails to log on, then his account will be disabled. Now, that might probably also be applicable to the manager, um, uh, the project manager, or to the approver. Now, there's two ways of 
achieving that. The bad way would be, of course, duplicating the code in a separate classes. Um, that wouldn't be a good solution. We would probably choose to have an abstract superclass where we had this functionality and the other ones would then inherit it. An alternative would be a data-oriented approach is say, no, let's just separate the two. I mean, I am passing a user object, which could be any of these three types, and I'm passing it to a method where it should validate. And it is not that strange. We'll get to that a bit later. You might now think, hmm, that sounds not good. But I'll, I'll, I'll bet I can convince you that it's actually something you might be doing already right now. So, testing in isolation. If you have code and data in one object, then it's just really harder to create these objects and to initialize them properly for testing if you have them separately. It makes it much easier. It tends to lead to less complicated systems, basically because this whole hierarchy of classes uh, they, that it's like being broken apart into two separate layers. Um, data should be stored in generic data structures. That was the second principle, right? So what are these generic data structures? Um, well, there would be lists or queues or maps. So, so we have these things in Java, so technically we could use them. That's the whole idea. And there's a reason for that, because it allows for a flexible data model. If you would want to add a new field to one of these data structures, it would be really easy, right? If it would be a map, you could really have a key value uh, thing. The key could be the name of the field, and of course the value field would be the value it would hold. So it allows you to quickly react to changes. Um, in general, it says, okay, you can also use generic functions. If my data structure is not a user class, which is very much typed to a certain type, uh, but it's a map, then of course there's much more functions you could apply to maps. Um, the data should be immutable. Now, immutable doesn't mean we can never change the data, right? But it is still, um, the reference to the data may change, but the underlying actual values, they can never change. That's the important thing. So if you want to change something, you should just return a new object, which is the reference, with uh, the new values. This gives predictable behavior, and the idea is, if you, um, have this program here from A to Z, and any of these places you can change your code. If there's going to be some code, uh, sorry, data change, and if that data changes, it's not according to what you expected, it's really hard to find where it is. But if you have defined specific places, it shouldn't be that much of a problem. Um, and of course, immutable values enable safe concurrency. If any of my threads accessing an object is not changing the objects, then I can never have any erase conditions. So there's never any problems there with concurrency. Right. The last one is maybe like the most unclear. It is separating data schema from data representation. But think untyped languages. Think JavaScript. Um, you can have a variable there where its type is not um, clear up front what type it would be or it's not defined. So, so this is all about expressing how to shape your data. Or, or think XML. XML is still data, right? So if we have XML, we would use an XSD to describe what type each of these fields are and also what values are possible if, 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 if it is a mandatory field or not. And we could do something similar, for instance, with JSON schema. So those are the principles. So let's see what has been added to Java so that we can support these data-oriented programmings. Now, if we're saying modern Java, I'm talking Java 17 to, well, 21 is almost there, right, in September. So 17 to 20. Um, is anyone here working with 17 or higher? 
Okay, that's already quite a lot of hands. That's very good to see. Um, we're going to look at a few things in specific. We're going to look at the records, sealed clauses, pattern matching, and switch functions for pattern matching. So it's going to be interesting to see um, 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 how familiar we, had, we are with things. Records, who knows records? Ah, that is so good to see, so many know it. I'll just give a short introduction then to records. <laughs> records are actually, well, they're transparent data carriers. You have data somewhere in your, object, uh, in your, in your application and you want to pass it around to different parts of your system. Um, this is how you define a record. And this is all you need to do to define a record. A record is just not a class. And as you can see, already in the definition, you are defining the name of the instance variables which make part of a record. And these instance variables, they're final instance variables. And we all know what that means. Once the constructor completes, the fields have their final value and they can't be changed anymore. So here I'm basically saying, okay, I, I, I got a record and it has two strings for email and password. It has a Boolean variable to indicate whether the account is blocked. And it has a counter how many login attempts are there. Just by writing this, so I have these four instance variables, I have kind of getter methods to get the values out again. I got, of course, the equals, the hash code is overwritten, there's a constructor made for me, all, all this code just with this one line. If I want to retrieve any of the values, well, sorry, this is how we actually create it, it's, it's just like you would create a normal class. You know, we're using the var keyword here because the compiler can do type inference, so he knows, okay, user will be a user record, you just provide all the values, and you got yourself a brand new record. If you want to retrieve the value of the email field, you can write it like this. So no more getter, setter, this Java bean convention thing. Um, well, setters weren't there anyway because they're immutable, but the getters. But we can just refer to the name of the field and retrieve the value for it. Um, that's nice. but. It comes with something extra, which are called compact constructors, which you basically can write like this. What you're telling here is that you're saying, okay, I got a user record, and um, this is my constructor, but you're not specifying any of the fields, because the compiler says, listen, mate, I, I, I know which field you're having because you defined them up there. You don't have to tell me again. And in this way, you can still do all your validations of the values coming in, so if I'm referring on the first line to the require none null of an email, I'm actually referring to the parameter value and not to the instance variable. Actually, if you look at it, I'm not setting any values here because I'm not setting the instance variables. The compiler will take care of that for me. Great, those are records. Um, immutable data carriers. You can already see where this is going in, in respect to um, data-oriented programming. Right, sealed classes. Um, sealed classes were added to Java for a reason, because if you define a class in Java, let's say you define a pub, well, basically you're, you're creating a public class. Um, that, that's the option you have in Java, isn't it? If you look at it at either you make your class public and technically anyone can inherit from it, or you decide to make it final, like for instance a string class um, that no one can inherit. And you really don't have, well, you can do a little bit with, 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 with um, uh, access modifiers, but in general those are the two flavors you have in Java. Either everyone can access it or no one can. Well, in comes sealed classes, because with sealed classes you have the ability to say, nah, I'm going to determine myself who's allowed to inherit from me. And everywhere where I say sealed classes, the same applies to sealed interfaces. So, this is a sealed interface. We had these three types of users before, right? So, I'm now saying, okay, this interface user, there's only three 
subtypes that are allowed to inherit from me. A prover, project manager, and a regular user. And that means that if any other class tries to implement this interface, it will say, uh uh, no, not allowed. The compiler will complain. So suddenly you have complete control of who is allowed to inherit from your data. So, um, but each of these classes meant mentioned here because we have the sealed interface and then it says blah, permits. So all the classes after the permits clause, they have to tell themselves again how they are going to handle inheritance. And there's three possible options. Like, the easiest one is that approver in this case says, you know what, I'll, I'll permit timesheet approver and invoice approver. He does the same like the main class. The second option is project manager. We just said we already have too many projects, managers, or managers in general, so we're going to make this class final. That's the second option. No one can inherit from project manager. And there's a third option, which is the non-sealed class. And basically, what non-sealed here is saying is, uh, you know, I, I, I don't care anymore. Anyone can inherit from me. So, so completely fine with me. I don't have any secret. You may all inherit from me. And though it may seem that suddenly you're throwing away your carefully crafted object inheritance strategy out of the window, it isn't really like that because anyone inheriting from regular user will always be of that type. So even if I have 10 different types, I will always, they always will have the same super type. So, sealed classes. And then the third part that we need is pattern matching. Now, what is pattern matching? Pattern matching was added in Java 17 carefully. Um, and pattern matching is all about having a predicate, a test, an object where you apply this predicate to. And if the test is successful, then we can extract one or more pattern variables. And these pattern variables will be in flow scope. So let's look at an example. We have this line here, and it says um, return user is an instance of approver A. And this may look a bit like, oh, but wait a minute, instance of has already been in Java like forever, right? But this is the instance of pattern matching, so it's a bit different. You might notice a little A there behind approver, which is not in your normal instance of. So in this situation, the predicate, instance of, is the predicate. So that is the test we're going to apply to user, which the, is the object to test. And if this test is successful, then we have a pattern variable will be created, A, and basically user is then the casted instance of approver. So it's cast to approver now, so I can make it behave like it is approver. And the flow scope basically means that between the brackets, A exists, and as soon as we get to the end of the brackets, A no longer exists. Great. Um, next thing they did was add pattern matching to switch. And we all know switch, right? We, 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 had, we always had the switch um, 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 statement. And then later with Java, we got the switch expressions where we suddenly could do uh, different things and switch suddenly became kind of functions and they returned values. Well, Java has something like this now too. Um, um, it says here, I'm getting in a user and it should just return me if this is an approver or a project manager or a regular user. So I'm actually testing here for the class type. And the type suddenly becomes kind of, of a value to, to your code. Because it says, mm, well, I if it is like this, then um, um, please return true. So if approver, I I'm still having the pattern variable A then, not using it, but it will still be there, and I'm returning a value. So it now is testing against class types, and not where 
switch would normally do, test against values. So that's why we say that actually switch has been lifted and data is now of, has become values. So you can have data objects and they are just normal uh, values. So we can also write DESI because there's a second line in here where we say a hey, approver. This is called um, a guarded pattern where we can say, oh, if it is an approver, that's great, but I only want to return true for approvers if the approver is still active. Otherwise, I can't show them in the list of active approvers. And then you can see there's actually another line with approver just without the when. The whole idea about pattern matching uh, with switch here is that the compiler can reason about exhaustiveness. If you would have a normal switch situation where you say integer, case one, case two, case three, you always have to do a default as well, right? Because it might not, add, it might not lead to one of these and it can't do anything, so it has to know what to do when it is not one, two, or three. Well, here the compiler actually knows. It says, oh, you're giving me a user, but there's like only four types that can implement a user, three types. Um, three types that can implement a user, so it can really check for those three types. Now, I needed to add the second line here because the first one actually excludes part of it, right? It excludes the approvers that are not active, so they have to be caught by the second case. Java didn't stop there. Um, we had records and then it thought, we're going to do record pattern matching. And that consists of two parts. First of all, this very simple part. If the user is an instance of a user record, apparently we can now use a user record there as well. We're going to name it UR. UR is now a user record and I can call a method on it right away. The second part is even perhaps even more interesting. Look at this switch statement. Okay, there's a few things in there which are really new. First of all, okay, we're getting this record and we're saying, if it's a case null, before you could never do this. You always had to check before your switch, when you use the switch statement, to check if the value in your switch statement wasn't null. If, if it was null and you didn't check, you would get a null pointer exception. Um, the Java language designers said, oh, okay, that's not a good thing, so we'll switch around and we'll put that in as a valid value. But then the second case, user record, and then it says string, string, boolean, int. Anyone has any idea what is going on here? That man in the end. Oh, you're brilliant and stealing my show. <laughs> That is actually correct. We're destructuring the record here. So it seems like we're saying again, oh, wait a minute, I have to define a user record with the same structure and the same signature again? Well, that doesn't make sense. But actually what is happening here is that um, we're saying, oh, could you please take it? If it is a user record, could you please take it and then assign the email address to the field E, the password to P, um, and, and so on for the boolean and the number of attempts. So it is destructuring the record. Instead of a constructor where you apply individual values and create an object, now we're taking an object and pulling them into individual fields. So that is really uh, a very powerful construct. A little change which and was added to Java 20 is that you no longer have to tell now um, to the compiler what that it was a string, string, boolean, integer, because the compiler says, well, I mean, you, you say user record. I can look it up myself and I know what these types are. So I'll use, just tell var so uh, you can use them. And in Java 21, there's going to be an additional feature where you say, you know what, I, I, I don't really care about the third and the fourth field. You can just put an underscore there, and then the compiler, you'll tell the compiler, ignore these values, and he won't do it. So that makes it even more readable. That's actually really nice. Um, this is a bit of a special thing, because they said, ah, you know, we have this as enhanced for loop, right? For, and then you could loop over a collection like here. 
Um, so you're getting a list of users and then you can loop over it and you can do the destructuring inside of the for loop. Um, and this is a bit of a special case because this will only be available in Java 20. It was added in Java 20. Um, it will be removed again in Java 21 for reasons unknown to me, but I thought, nah, we might bring it back in, in the future, but not now. Great. And of course, here you can use the same thing where you don't specify the specific types, but use var instead. Right. Finally, we got to the part where the code really comes. So, combining Java and data-oriented programming, let's do a quick recap, because we said separate data from logic, right? Well, is that really strange, separating data from logic? Um, first of all, you could do it with static methods, because static methods, you know, they're great. They're, they're great to use, and you can just pass them a class, they can work on it. You don't need to create objects, so that could be really good. And for anyone who was at the session here before, um, Static data fields are bad, but static methods definitely are not bad. And if you think about it, I mean, I guess a lot of you, who's using Spring here, Spring Framework? Right, many hands. Are you using, aren't you using kind of like already splitting data and functions in Spring? Because all your code is normally like, what, a Spring Bean? Some add surface annotation that you will inject somewhere. And if you call a method on it, you'll probably pass it to the data. So it isn't that strange. And for all the other ones that were using still AGBs or something else on JEE, basically you're doing the same there. If you think about it, there's this annotation stateless within uh, uh, Java EE already where you're kind of saying, you know, um, this doesn't hold any data. So it is not that strange an idea. Um, Data should be stored in generic data structures. Oh, yeah, well, we can do that in Java, Java, right? Java 9 gave us this great method. So instead of this user record, we could like make it in a map, key value objects and stuff like that. And then we could actually retrieve the values. It's not really pretty. And I think we just found with the records that we have a way better way of using a kind of generic data structure. Of course, you still have to define it, but it is especially meant for that. Um, the data should be immutable. Well, that's easy because we just said records are immutable. So that comes in really handy. And the data schema should be separated from representation. Um, I, 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 mean, I mean, that would be crazy, right? If we, if we would just would lose use these key value types and stuff like that because Java gives us compile time type safety. It will check for us if we're using, uh, if we're not using two user, uh, uh, two uppercase on an integer object. So it would be crazy to throw that out. So basically we are left with these two options. Separate data from logic and the data should be immutable. So let's look at an example. We all know the Java optional class added in Java 8, and basically you have a variable, and might be they might be no, might not be no. You're not really sure. It's a kind of Schrödinger's cat situation. Until you look into it, you will find out if it's either null or not null. So why not wrap it into this optional class? And if you have this optional class, then basically you can ask it uh, via is optional or, or later if optional and uh, provide a method um, um, to see if this data is actually, if it is null or not, and then act upon it. Um, Brian Getz, the language architect, he said, well, if we had record and sealed classes and pattern matching when we had Java 8, probably we, we would have written it like this. And what we're saying here is, okay, we have an interface, opt, which is a generic interface. It's a generic type, so it could be any type. And it only has two possible values that are allowed. It's either sum with a value that's in there, or it is none. Right? Now, if we would look at an example of this code, take this class. We're saying, okay, 
a class that takes in some parameters and it calls the run method. And the run method, there's two things. It calls a validate on these arguments. And if the validate, and it passes that value on to the process method. Well, the validate is a string, takes a string array of arguments and the processor takes this opt again. Now, if we look at the implementation then, this would be how the validate would work. It just checks, okay, are there any arguments? If there's none, it will turn an opt none, right? So because no argument, so there's no nothing to return. And if there's something, it will take the first command line argument and create an instance with opt sum. And that means that in the processing code, the process there, it can really reason about it because it now knows that whatever it is getting can only ever have two possible values. Either something is, it is some, and then some value is in there, or it is none, and then you can just simply ignore the value that is in there. So basically what you now have done is, these are the only two possible values, any other invalid state has been ruled out. One of these is the only possible solution. So, what it means is that we're modeling the data as data because we now are really reasoning about the data uh, as if it was a number with a value. You know, we're, we're reasoning about uh, the value. The data is still immutable. We should validate at the boundary. If we're having, like, let's say, my, you have some JSON web service, so it, it's a web service, it has a method, it takes in a JSON payload, um, probably that's the first place where you want to check. So your first check would probably be check if the JSON is valid. If the JSON is valid, you're creating your records where we just saw that in the compact constructor you can add your validations. So that is validating at the border and then make illegal states unrepresent uh, unrepresentable. Um, yeah, it was some or none, but can't be anything else. So let's look at one final example. Um, say we have this REST resource. Um, well, I it's a normal class, right? It has a data service, which is final, and it probably gets uh, injected via the constructor. And it has two methods. It has a get to search for values, and it has a post for creating some values. Now, if we would look at the search first, um, if we're going to search for a value, say we're searching for something, um, it could technically have three possible values, right? Uh, we could find nothing, because we just search for a really weird term. Um, if we search for the primary key, like a customer number, we're probably getting one, one returned result, or we could have multiple values. If we're searching for a name, we're probably getting multiple results. So if we would model this, we could make a sealed interface like this, where we're saying, okay, sealed interface could be of any type, could be user, could be product, whatever. And there's a few possibilities. No result, an exact result, in that case we're specifying the result, or it could have a multi-result because we searched for a name and then we get a list as a result. Now, if you would have the search method, it would actually say, okay, th this is the example code and we're just returning an exact result. But it's basically how your search method, if it re would react upon these things and create things. And, and then your remaining code could really look like this. You've got the search method. It takes in a value. You're calling the service find projects and you know that find projects will only ever return one of three possible values, right? It would be the no result the exact result or the multi-result. So your code is completely clean. Again, you're taking actions upon the code and upon the values, and um, your code is very clean. And actually, if, if you look at, at how it is, you could reuse this almost in all your endpoints then for searching. But no one can ever look at this and say, I have no idea what happens when we, when we have got multiple results. So the code is actually very, very clear. Going back to the other part, 
where we say, okay, we also have this post method, the create. Um, so this create method, um, it, it has this master data source, right? So it gets an object master data, it does a validate, and if the data is valid, it will be stored. Now, master data could again, you know, have an interface and say, okay, I'm permitting project activity, subactivity. A bit different here now. Before we defined everything inside the sealed interface, you can still define it like this way, where you say, okay, a record implements master data. So that's another way of describing it. Um, the other way with none and some, that was really nice together, but if it's really like a long list of information, then this would be a better way to model it. So we have these three possible subclasses. And then we have the validate method. And the validate method would again be the same. Okay, say this data came from this JSON interface, right? So the data comes in, um, you're gonna validate it. If the JSON is crap, then you probably get a null in master data already. And then you can simply say, okay, if it's null, validation will fail. And otherwise, um, it will determine again, okay, what type of object did I get? And based on the type of the object, it can call the correct validation method, which makes again really clean. It, could, it is really mm -hmm. almost like if you say case one, two, three, only now you're talking about object types. But object types have become a first class citizen in this way. So you can do your proper validations. Um, and now we know that the validate method will always uh, return either true or false. So the store method to store the information doesn't have to reason about being null anymore. So it can just again do its thing, but again based on type of class. So that makes it very easy to reason about your code, makes it very easy to follow. Um, one could say, okay, if we get like another new type um, next to project activity, sub-activity, that means a whole lot of rewriting my code, which is correct. But the good thing is the compiler will tell you in every spot, listen, mate, um, 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 we had this hierarchy here where we defined a sealed class, you specified four types, you're implementing only three, could you please come here and fix it? So the compiler will really help you there. So, as a summary, data-oriented programming treats data as first-class citizens. It reasons about the, the data as, if it, as it reasons about strings or integers that we have. It, it looks at their values. In that case, the data drives your application because we saw that depending on which type they are, we're going in different parts of our application. So that is really how the flow is going. Um, well, Java supports data-oriented programming via records, sealed classes, and pattern matching. Any questions? Oh, there's a question down there. Thank you very much for the interesting talk. And my question is related to the idea of separating data and logic itself because mm. all these points that you've shown are absolutely valid i think that th these are be uh, good approaches that you should apply in your code to make it more maintainable but if we are working with a regular let's say a regular java application like an enterprise one yep. uh, if you separate data uh, if you separate logic from the entity so it would make um, Probably that uh, your whole logic is spread across the whole application. I've seen this several times. I understand that if you are working with uh, you know data transfer or data enrichment, because I work in big data department, we have many such services. When you read from input and uh, write to some sync, and there are some transformations, then okay, that's totally fine. But if I have complex business logic, do I really want to separate it from the entity? So that's my question. Do I really want to separate? Um, 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 the data from uh, the entity. Separate logic from the, the logic, entity. Yeah, yeah, the logic, yeah, exactly, the business logic. Um, again, I, I asked before, good question by the way, because that is one of the, the especially to Java developers, object-oriented developers, 
it doesn't feel natural to have static methods where we do things, right? It does, doesn't feel very good because we, we, we have been trained to make everything an object. And so that's why we normally would like to have objects and um, we have learned about encapsulation. So we have data and we have methods performing uh, on this data. And, but like I asked before, who is using Spring? If you use Spring, again, I think we are already doing that in large parts of our application. Because if you have your Spring Bean, it will very unlikely contain state. Because the state will be somewhere else. You, of, of course, you can still have an entity object. And it, I'm not proposing to say, OK, we have an entity object like the at entity, so the thing we're reading from the database, the JPA entity, and saying, oh, there should be no logic in there at all. Um, um, but I think already when we started adopting the repository pattern instead of the active record pattern, we decided to move a lot of behavior to a different class, right? Because active record would basically be capable of saving itself, retrieving itself, and with the repository pattern, that Spring actually proposed. Um, it has already has been moved to a repository class. This doesn't have to state. So the answer is it depends. Sometimes, <laughs> that's always the best answer, isn't it? <laughs> no, but it's true, really. Sometimes you want to do it, sometimes you can't. One thing is for sure, records, I, I didn't mention that before, but records can't be used with JPA because, you know, JPA describes you should have an, um, and, and, and no argument uh, constructor, so zero argument constructor, which contradicts with records because records require all the arguments to be there. Uh, yeah, speaking of static methods, they are not polymorphic. So if I make a database call in a static method, or I'm reading from file, or I make an HTTP call, I cannot stop this, I cannot mock this. So maybe it's better to make an interface at several implementations instead of static method. That, that is definitely true, depending, especially if you would go to the database, yes, then I, I would definitely, if you would do any kind of potentially blocking operation, I would definitely choose something like that. Um, and, and, and that's why it doesn't mean that data-oriented programming means kick out all your objects. You never have to do use objects and classes anymore. That's not it. Uh, they, it can perfectly go together. Data-oriented programming can work very fine with object-oriented programming. And in fact, all the ones here loving functional programming, there's a lot of you know, paradigms in there um, that from functional programming that you can see in um, data-oriented programming. Thanks for your question. Thank you. Are there any more questions? And if not, then thank you very much for your attention and enjoy the conference.